Can't hear you, Carson. Good afternoon. Turn it up. Turn it up. Can't hear you. Yes. We can't hear you. How's this? Loud enough? No. Yeah. Okay, welcome to this year's uh, Adaptic. Adaptic, as uh, most of you already know, means well, that's pretty much psychology experts debate and negotiate topics in conversation. Uh, thanks to Chris Masbury who came up with that uh, uh, acronym last year. Uh, so this is the second time in a year, uh, or in, 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 uh, in a row. Uh, last year we discussed the notion of the mind, and if psychology still needs it. This year we'll be talking about the future of psychology, and kind of more provocatively, does psychology have a future? Uh, for those who have read the news in the last couple of days, uh, some questions may come up today that uh, relate precisely to that, uh, to that topic. I think it's more timely than ever before, if you have followed the news. Um, <coughs> we have this year, sorry, I have the wrong word. <laughs> we have uh, five speakers this year. Um, well, I can't hear myself. <laughs> um, we have five speakers. Each speaker will have exactly 15 minutes to be used at the next level. Um, We'll have the start with Chris Westbury today, after that Kyle Matheson, after that I'll be uh, presenting myself, then we'll have Chris Sturdy and uh, finally Sherry uh, on scene. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes, uh, and the idea is that they leave a few minutes at the end for kind of informative questions, uh, but that we save the, the discussion for the end. We have plenty of room for discussion if every speaker uh, sticks to their, uh, their time. And Jana, sitting over there, um, she will see to it that uh, indeed uh, no speaker uses more than 15 minutes. And it will be strictly enforced, even for me. Which is <laughs> very hard for me. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, provocative, entertaining, dazzling, audacious, nerve wracking, <laughs> tantalizing, iconoclastic. That always the legal, this is the benefit. Uh, please uh, hold the first presenter, this specimen. I'm going to say no. 
we would never ever be able to absorb by neuroscience because we actually need a level of uh, representation that's separable from the underlying uh, neurological level. <coughs> uh, I have to apologize for the second time now because people who have been around the department for a long time know that Clay and I, Clay basically and I had this very same debate quite a few years ago now, and I'm going to use uh, some of those slides from that same debate because it was really about exactly the same thing. This is how Clay and I were when we were younger. <laughs> So I want to start off quickly by just reminding you or telling you that there's two kinds of dualism that people talk about today in uh, scientific dualism. I'm not talking about the soul, I'm talking about whether or not there's a dissociation between the underlying neurological representation and the psychological representation. So it has nothing to do with religion. This is scientific dualism. There's two forms, one's property dualism, one's substance, substance uh, sorry, predicate dualism. I'm going to go into religion, I'm saying substance dualism, that was Descartes. So property dualism says mind and body are one single substance, because that's the only kind of dualism I'm talking about today, but they have different properties in the world. In other words, some, some, there's something magical about neurons, basically, that allow them to have properties that uh, nothing else has. You can tell by the fact that it's uh, magical, but I'm not so fond of that. The second form is predicate dualism that says there's one single substance, and that that's all the, the only form of dualism I'm considering. But the properties of the mental are not descriptively useful to the physical properties. Lots of people have put this forward. Gilbert Ryle most eloquently, Jerry Fodor most horribly, because I hate reading Jerry Fodor and I don't recommend him. And here's a good example to make that clear if you don't get it. The concept of a traffic jam is not useful to physics. You can't talk about traffic jams in terms of physics, so it's not and usefully or easily, and maybe not at all, even though of course everything that's involved in a traffic jam is subject to the laws of physics. So predicate dualism is just saying that. It's just saying that certain things happen at certain higher levels that can't be explained by the lower level laws, and that's uh, the argument that I want to put forward. I think that's good. <coughs> so I'm going to argue for predicate dualism, as I already said, which I think is the more palatable one for most people in the room, but I want to make the strong argument that I already said. I want to make the argument not just that it's a good way to think about it, but it's the law. We have to be predicate dualists. There's no sensible way you can be a modest uh, if you understand the issues. <clears throat> so here's the easy argument, the argument that you might say when I'm finished. Well, that didn't really prove your point, Chris, and you'll be right. Uh, and then I'll prove the point in the second one. So the first argument is just a very straightforward one, which is uh, there's many different ways to code any specific algorithm. There's many different ways you can put so-called mental or abstract computational representations into a computer program or, I dare say, into the brain. And here's a really nice way to show that by looking at a very simple problem, which is find the difference between the sum of the squares, the first 100 natural numbers, and the square of the sum. Very basic programming exercise, which is in fact where I've found for game programmers. And uh, if you look at that, you go, well, there's two things we have to do to solve this problem. First of all, we have to get the sum of the squares, then we have to get the square of the sum, and then we find the difference between them. And that's how most people would solve that problem. And here's an example in life. Language that I learned when I was an undergraduate that no one uses anymore. This, you don't have to go through it, but I color code it to show you they do exactly what you would think you would do to solve that problem. First of all, they get the sum of the squares, then they get the square of the sum, and then they subtract one from the other, and uh, that solves the problem. So that seems straightforward, but look at this one. This is another solution to exactly the same problem that was actually written in the world, but you can see that it's quite abstract, it can be written in any language very easily. And it solves the problem exactly the same, uh, just as well. It gives you the right answer. But uh, it does it in a very strange way that I personally don't understand. But if you had to color code where they were doing the thing that they're asking, the sum of the, uh, sum of the squares and the square of the sum, you couldn't. It's not in there. It solves the problem, but it doesn't break up the problem the way that the problem is specified. So you can have um, algorithms that solve the same problem that but make um, different references to very different things. I'm using the word thing deliberately to say that that could be a representation, it could be an algorithm that could be whatever you want, some kind of abstract computational object. And what makes them the same, of course, is only that they can do the same function. The reason we say those two programs are the same, despite the fact they have nothing in common, is because they, they, they can do the same thing. And that's what we were carrying in the service. If you wanted to say, ask that question, where is the sum of the squares? I would have to say, I mean, when you're making a mistake, and the mistake you're making is assuming there has to be a sum of the squares somewhere in there, just because the problem is, is, is um, formulated originally in those terms. 
That thing that you think has to exist because it's in the question doesn't exist. It turns out not to exist at all. And I think this is one of the great lessons of, of computer science since the 1950s that um, people have not fully um, taken on in psychology, but it's not by everyone. Because it's a very puzzling and annoying thing to take on, which is after the computer came along and we started programming, we started making different programming languages, and we started understanding there's different algorithms and different ways of representing data, it became possible to understand, and we're forced to understand, that some things that are obviously necessary in explaining any particular problem are in fact neither necessary nor even things. They don't even exist. And you can look for the thing and you can't find them. So we're forced into a situation where um, we have to be doubtful that we can figure out how brain solve the problem from the folk uh, description of the problem. A lot of energy studies do that, right? A lot of energy studies do exactly what I just showed you with image studies, for example, and there's other studies too. Um, but I just showed you the list program. They take the thing they're studying, they break it up into folk categories that they think are the right ones, and then they uh, uh, put people in the scanner and use those folk categories. If you take what I just showed you about list to be uh, a problem, then it's going to be a problem to do with that. It might not have the correct uh, way of representing the problem. <coughs> The second way is a little stronger because one thing you can say about that argument is, well, Chris, all you really showed is that uh, representations would be difficult. But once we figure out the proper representation, then neuroscience can take over. So maybe psychology has to be around to figure out the proper representation, and then uh, neuroscience can take over. So here's our stronger argument that will say why neuroscience is not going to take over. And if I run out of time, the essence of the argument is uh, individual differences make it impossible to know how uh, brains are encoding things between individuals. There's not enough low-level similarities to be able to do it um, in any meaningful way. The work I like to do is illustrate this comes from Walter Freeman's work. He's a very strange, very brilliant guy who did work on rabbit olfaction, mostly in the 70s and, and beyond. And he used uh, multi-channel EEGs to study the olfactory model of the rabbit, which is the thing that's been playing there to their uh, the arrows. It's a very, very small part of a very, very small brain. My wife hated that I used this picture, so my apologies. I don't like that that means. Um, so his goal is also to understand the meaning of perception. That's what he's interested in. He said, how can we understand what a particular um, stimulus means to the organism? And the reason he studied the olfactory wall is shown there. It's a very good thing to study because it has relatively clean input. It's unpreprocessed, as we know, it's jacked or everything. It's the olfactory wall. It's a um, single source, and it's easy to control, as well as that the uh, olfactory ball is small and very highly specialized, it only does olfaction, and you can raise rabbits and know exactly what they smell. You completely control everything that they smell. It's much harder to control, as people have done it, the other animals where they control what they saw, but it's much more difficult to smell, not so hard. So uh, I'm going to run out of time if I spend too long on this. I'll just say one possible way it could work is maybe there's a decoder in the brain that takes in the smell and then somehow represents it and then returns to a state, very much like a camera. So you take a smell, the olfactory ball processes it, and uh, then returns to its original state, it saves your camera and you take a picture. <coughs> if this was true, then we should be able to identify specific patterns that are localized to limited parts of the ball that correspond to the nerve cell assemblies that are doing the particular calculation for any particular given smell. And we should also expect that the olfactory bulb will return to its original activation state after it's uh, finished processing a particular input and can smell the advance. This is where Freeman started. He thought this is what he was going to find. This is what he was expecting. So on the basis of the information processing hypothesis, the one I just said, the camera hypothesis, I confidently expected to find differences in the spatial um, patterns and amplitude with different, uh, with different odors. Instead, I found that the gamma patterns were like handwritten signatures of facial expression. No two births were identical, but each was easily recognizable as unique for each animal. I added all the emphasis. So he did find that spatial patterns were changing, but they um, only changed when the builder had a particular meaning for the rabbit, and they changed in ways that were not the same between individuals. He couldn't find any spatial pattern that could be localized to some limited part of the olfactory ball across individuals, which is what he had expected to see. So he concluded every neuron on the ball participated in every response to a learned odor. The entire, the entire, entire olfactory ball was doing that. The calculation in the worst was in a localized place. 
He couldn't derive anything uh, with his eight electrodes, which uh, is not a full measure, but he couldn't derive anything about the spatial patterns from uh, spatial patterns of uh, receptor activity from pre-processing. And he, he concluded that the only way those patterns could arise is as a result of the dynamic state transition between the entire factory wall with each inhalation. In other words, the entire olfactory ball changed every time the lab would smell something. Uh, the other thing that's important, very closely related to the first argument, is he found the patterns weren't invariant with respect to stimuli, even within the same individual. So even within the same rabbit, the same odor didn't cause the same pattern from time one to time two. Uh, and anything that you did, any, any time that the uh, animal was exposed to an odor, changed the entire pattern. Everything changed in the olfactory ball each time the uh, animal was exposed to an odor. And it never went back to, to a, a pattern that he'd seen before. So he said uh, the hypothesis that uh, activity invoked by odor represented that and the odor was abandoned. And here's the key conclusion that he made. Each, step, each state transition is guided into a new basin of attraction by all past influences in concert. The resulting spatial pattern activity in varying degrees manifests all of those influences. This multi-determinacy within the cell, in the cell, within a single individual, Comprising the active brain supports the conclusion that each perceptual construct reflects the entire corpus of individual past experience. An appropriate term for the outcome is that the percept constitutes not a representation of stimulus, it is the meaning of the stimulus for the self, which is going to vary between individuals for any number of uh, reasons. So, this is a, a strong argument in favor of uh, predicate dualism because it says the way the brains encode stimuli is just not consistent between indivi individuals. So that argues against the weakness of the first argument, saying, well, maybe eventually we'll figure out the proper functions and be able to use those functions to brain read or something like that, thereby reducing psychology and neurology. It says that's not going to happen because there's no general brain signal mapping uh, outside of early sensory areas where it is true. And so there's never going to be a science of neural encoding that takes content into account, that takes meaning into account, that takes semantics into account. It can't happen because uh, the, the entire brain changes with every uh, meaningful thing that the organism uh, kind of if you're willing to extrapolate from the olfactory or the rabbit brains in general. And that's exactly what predicate dualism says. The problem is that are not descriptively reducible to a physical qualities. And uh, I, I think this is a good conclusion for psychology. It saves psychology because it explains why psychology can't be reduced to neuroscience. We have to have a level it looks at the meaning of uh, content, and that level is what we call psychology. And I have no time for the third way, so thank you very much for inviting me. And if you have any time, if you have any questions, I have time for one. 30 seconds. <laughs>
but I do have a talk. I can definitely um, tell you something about what I was thinking. The if you may have known that my brother is an improv comedian in town, and he goes out every Friday and makes up stuff for an hour. So I'm sure I can make up 15 minutes of. Oh, well, I should start the timer. Um, so, this is called the pedantic talks, and the question that we were posed with was, what is the future of psychology? So at first, the best thing to do, I guess, I don't know if the computer scientists are here to do, but what they would have had us do last time when we discussed consciousness was we need to first define what we mean by future, and what we mean by um, psychology. So future, let's say, is any, any time after we're done in this set of talks up until the world explodes or whatever, however it ends. And psychology, we, as used kind of globally as the study of human behavior, but the, the meaning of the word um, translates to the study of the mind. And so um, what we want to know is how is the study of the mind going to develop into the future? And I hope that everyone would have hope that I, being the newest member, oh, besides David, our newest faculty member, our newest guy is member with the freshest ideas, um, and also one and only neuroscientist speaking today would try to argue that psychology will go away, uh, that we can reduce psychology down to physical neuroscience principles, and we can all lose our jobs in some time in the future. Um, but as I, and I, that is what I wanted to argue, that's what I was planning to argue. And then as I read and I researched and I thought down at the river about this, I, I've come to think otherwise. So I'll, I'll step you through uh, my thought process in that regard. So, if you recall, I talked last pedantic last year about uh, we talked about consciousness, and I introduced then, at the time, my uh, uh, hypothetical new graduate student that I had just picked up, named Notaz Ombe. Notaz. That's a great sound. <laughs> And Notas, he was my first graduate student, he was awesome. He came in, he, was, he had great grades, he had great GRE scores. Um, he came into the lab, he picked up all the methods, he, we studied consciousness together, which some of you know is one of my interests to study our, our awareness of the world. And Notas was doing really well, we published in this hypothetical world, we published tons of papers in the top journals. He was studying the nature of consciousness and trying to reduce the idea of consciousness down to the biological bits and pieces. And I'll tell you in a bit about how that story went, that he was successful and what happened. Um, but if you'll recall, Notaz, When he won the Nobel Prize in this hypothetical world, he, at his speech, he he announced to everyone that he whoa, he had no inner world. He had no what was not like anything to be known to us, and that all this understanding he had about consciousness was only a kind of book understanding. He didn't know experientially what it was like. Say to. He knew everything about red, he knew how the brain implemented red, he could shock you at a certain part of your brain, he would see red, he could make anything you were looking at red, but he'd never seen red himself. And he was wondering when he gave that speech what it was that he was missing in the understanding. So essentially, no test is what I was trying to prove that the that the psychology or the mind, or study of the mind, can just be distilled down to bio biology and chemistry and physics. And that he had everything in common with any other graduate student in the lab. His brain had a brain full of brain bits, and the brain did all the right stuff and it computed everything correctly. He had all the biology in common with my other graduate students. Um, but he, he was just not. 
not there. So, as I was thinking about how this might be possible for us to understand psychology purely in terms of biology, I revisited um, work by David Marr, who I guess the, uh, Chris alluded to these levels of representation that we can use to study something. David Marr, the year before I was born, I guess, um, was a studying vision and he was studying, uh, I guess, the cerebellum and the hippocampus as well, but he, he wrote a book right before he died, I guess. He died when he was 35 of cancer. Um, but he wrote a book um, in which he laid out the three levels of analysis that we can use to study the mind, um, which he framed as the computational, the what and the why, the representational, or the algorithm, which you could say is the how, and then the lowest level, the physical. I'm sure he spelled it right in his book. <laughs> <laughs> so, any theory of anything we could talk about in these, maybe in other, other levels of analysis, but these would be the three fundamental levels that we might use to talk about, say, vision. Or I think in his book he talks about a cash register. That the cash register is just adding money, that's what it's doing, it's why it's quite obvious. How it does that is some algorithm it's using to do the addition, and then the implementation might be an electronic circuit or, or a digital um, representation of the algorithm, or it could be a physical out, like a, a, a wheel that's turning around doing the adding. And the same goes for the brain, so that in, in terms of the brain, we should be able to, sorry, the mind brain. The mind brain, we should be able to describe also with these three levels of analysis, what it's doing, why is it doing it. So in terms of vision, what is the goal of vision is to make some internal representation of the outside sensory world. Why is it, again, obvious we want to know what's out there and run away from the bears that are chasing our ATVs? Did anyone ever read the bears attack someone on an ATV? But the guys have bears. Um, the representational or algorithmic stage of vision is, well, let's go down to the lowest level. The physical implementation is what you learn in your physiology class. This is the retina, these are the, the, this is the cell, these are the chemicals that are in the membrane of the cell. You can zoom in further and further and further into the physical implementation of vision. But what's, what's important to see about this hierarchy a is that it is a hierarchy, so that the um, different physical implementations could be used just as easily to implement a given algorithm. And different algorithms could be used just as easily to implement a different computational goal. Another feature of this is that likely, much like vision I guess, that there's most likely a small number of physical units, building blocks, that can be put together in different ways to make a bigger number of algorithms that can be put together in different ways to make an even bigger number of bigger computational goals. So that it does seem a little bit reductionist that it, maybe then we can um, take each computation, find out the algorithms, take each algorithm, find out the physical implementation, and then our whole department can just close up and we'll, it'll all just be um, neuroscience at that point. All we would need to know is synapses and junctions and maybe algorithms as well. But I would argue that the, much like Chris did, that the computational part of this hierarchy is where we are, obviously, as psychologists. We're coming up with the bigger theories of what it is the brain is implementing and why it's implementing those things. And as psychologists, and so let's say that then, let's do this. We could say that here we are psychologists. The algorithm people, let's call them computer scientists. 
I must have found these guys physiologists. So, the future in this case of psychology, what I would claim is that as much as you might find out, the physiologist might find out, or the computer scientist might come to explain what the findings from the physiologist are, without this overarching hierarchical level of explanation of what it is that's implemented in these circuits, we don't really know, learn much about the mind brain. I'll give you an example from my own research at the time. The, so, um, well, no, let me just go, I won't tell you, I'll tell you briefly that I study attention, um, I study what it is we're paying attention to in the world, what we're aware of, and how our brain might prepare itself to, and our mind might prepare themselves to, to take in the world correctly. Um, but the data that I get in my lab is not, I get responses from the subjects, they press buttons, they re respond. I, I ask them, did you see that or not? Really personal questions that only they know the answer to. Um, but then I also collect physiology data from them. So I put electrodes on them, or we'll put them in a scanner, or we'll shine lasers into their brain. And we'll measure some of the physical implementations. And what I see as my goal is to consider these theories that have been made for hundreds of years of attention, and how it might work, and, co and cognitive theories and mathematical theories of attention that were all made without any mention of the brain, and then take all the physiological data that I collect in the lab, and design experiments, and make hypotheses about the algorithms that bridge those two levels. Does that make sense? So, um, I, and what I see as the future of psychology is, what, A, we have to be at the head of this hierarchy, we have to speak with the computer scientists, we have to speak with the physiologists and work together to attack similar problems, and we're in a position where we get to see more than maybe they're down at these lower levels that don't always see maybe the whole picture. I say they, but I also might consider myself a physiologist on some days. So, I'd say also the future of psychology is also the blurring of the lines between these disciplines. And that the students in this room today, I would encourage you to know just as much about the computer science algorithmic aspect and just as much about the physiology aspect as you do about the higher level what and the why of what's going on. So don't just investigate, say, what things are remembered better and why some things are remembered better than others, but measure from the brain while that's happening, and then try to develop algorithms and theories that might explain what computations are going on that you are able to pick up that physical reading and how those representations together um, subserve the function of the, of the higher level At one minute. So, no test, Bombay won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize for um, his theory of consciousness. He had an overarching understanding of consciousness that he understood the consciousness at these three levels. He understood the nuts and bolts in the brain of what gave rise to consciousness. He understood what algorithms the brain was implementing. And importantly, um, he understood some of the computations of what the purpose of consciousness is, which is, I think, the last frontier in terms of consciousness research of what we don't understand. And so it's the psychologists that need to be at the forefront of studying consciousness in this regard, that just taking bits and pieces and understanding all algorithms won't tell us entirely what consciousness is for. Thank you.
Okay, um, I brought a few uh, PowerPoint slides, but uh, not a full fledged presentation, but there's a few things that I want to put out here. And uh, when I introduced the speakers today, I said, well, you know, those who have kept up with the news uh, will uh, uh, have realized that the, the discussion about the future of psychology is very timely. Um, I have a few, let's see if I can get it to work. Um, Work better than So for those who have followed the news, uh, uh, you will have read the, the recent uh, news about uh, the status of psychological experiments. Um, this is one way it was, it was put out by the website Bismodo. Uh, they say a lot of published psychology results are bullshit. Um, and as you may have read, um, it turns out that in an attempt to replicate a hundred different experimental studies published in high-ranking journals, but only uh, one third of those uh, uh, experiments turned out to be replicable, or was, uh, they were able to replicate that. Uh, it's interesting actually to go to the website and see which studies uh, were not uh, replicated. Um, there was a lot of news about that. Some people were a bit more nuanced about this. Uh, but, um, I'm just going to show a few websites just to give you a set. But the question here is, what, what is going on if you can't replicate psychological studies? And um, I'm going to uh, juxtapose that, or the, the, the idea that there's something wrong with psychology with experimental studies, with other things that you can also read in the news. I hope this is uh, visible. Here, uh, this is a couple of months ago, uh, this appeared in the, in the news. Somebody who claimed that they were now able to store people's ideas and memories. So rather than having to bring a photo camera or a, a phone to a, a wedding and record it, uh, now the idea was that you could actually record people's brains and store it somewhere and then later relive those memories. Um, other things that, that always intrigue me that appear in the news, and of course the news has a way of, of, uh, of making something out of nothing, um, is people who claim that uh, science is now close to being able to read people's minds uh, because we can now have such sophisticated brain scan uh, equipment that uh, soon we'll be able to read directly what you think. Now, obviously we, we know that that's probably uh, a far stretch. Uh, I would even say that it is in principle impossible. But um, there's an interesting contrast here. On the one hand, you see that as a uh, problem of psychology. Uh, and on the other hand, there's this optimism about the future of uh, neuroscience and its ability to do what psychology always set out to do, namely, really understanding the mind, really understanding human behavior. Now, what I want to argue here, that this is not a neuroscientist capture the moment the brain records an idea. Um, but I want to argue here is that, um, and, and, and a little bit in line of what, uh, what Chris is arguing as well, but in a slightly different way, um, that this is in principle impossible. It's in principle impossible to uh, understand psychological stuff in pure neurological terms. In fact, I would argue that to make sense of anything that the brain is does, you need a psychology. If all you have is an account of what the brain does uh, in terms of uh, neuronal uh, activity, you 
th this would be uh, unintelligible. Um, you can know exactly what the brain does, yeah, in principle or in, in theory, but you would still not know what somebody is doing, let alone what somebody is thinking. Um, and of course, you could say, well, let's look at what they're doing and then see what the brain does. But that's that's cheap. Yeah. Uh, the idea here is, would it be possible to to explain behavior in terms of what the brain does, or the opposite? Would it be uh, possible to explain what the brain does in terms of behavior, uh, 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 kind of manifest, observable behavior uh, in the relational realm. And my argument is that no, in principle that's not possible. And an example that I've used in the past is, uh, say, jealousy. Uh, we're interested in the psychology of jealousy. And now we say, okay, what is it that the brain does when we're jealous? Yeah, well, where's the jealousy center? Maybe it's located specifically in a specific area of the brain. And the point here is, and in order to scan the brain when somebody is jealous, you need to know what jealousy is. Otherwise, you, just, you don't know that somebody's experience, uh, experiencing jealousy. In fact, you need to have a way to evoke jealousy when people slap them and have a crying issue. Now, how are you going to do that? And how do you know that what you're evoking here is, in fact, jealousy? And I would argue that the brain is not going to tell you. In fact, the, uh, you need to already know that. You need to have an account of jealousy in order to study what the brain does when somebody is jealous. And when you get that understanding of jealousy, you get that from the cultural realm. You get that from the stories that people tell about jealousy. You get that from reading Shakespeare, or the Bible, or Cain and Abel, or something. Uh, or you get that by, by asking people about it. Have you ever been really jealous about the field? But in any case, whatever definition, whatever operational account of jealousy you get from it, you need that in order to know what the brain is doing when people are jealous. But the brain is not going to tell you that. Now, I'm not saying that the brain is not relevant, uh, but I'm saying that it cannot be reduced to the brain. In that sense, I'm with, with Chris, but I'm in a slightly different way. I argue that psychological stuff, that, uh, behavior, and last year when I was presenting, I used uh, Gilbert Wilde's definition because, you know, it's a good old behaviorist, as some would call it, um, who talks about psychology as the study of uh, observable, intelligible behavior. The notion of intelligibility is interesting here. Uh, you see people behave, and already to call it behavior is to give it a certain intelligibility. Um, so let's say somebody is speaking, like I'm doing right now, somebody's writing. Those are behaviors, but they're behaviors only because they, they are intelligible. They mean something, they have a meaning. And that meaning, I would argue, does not derive from some kind of representation level, um, but it derives from a social cultural realm. Um, to, if I study, say, writing, I can on the one hand say, okay, how does it work psychomotorically? What does the brain do when people write? But again, for it to be writing, you need to understand that it's part of a cultural practice. Uh, writing is a historical practice that has developed historically over uh, thousands of years. Uh, and each of us, being able to write, has had to learn to write, has had to go through a process of cultural change. Writing is only writing as part of a culture. Uh, it's not a representation thing, it's not a purely neurological thing, it is a social cultural activity. Uh, but obviously, there's just a neurological underpinning that you can study, but that only makes sense if you already have an understanding of writing as a meaningful cultural activity. So, the argument that I'm making is that when you look at the, the, the brain, uh, let's say that those circles represent brains, that what brains do can only be uh, uh, explained in terms of what brains do. That is, the brain, if you want to see it as, uh, as a system that, that uh, processes some kind of input, the brain is the, the only source of its own input. Um, that is, to understand what the brain does, you need to understand that in terms of what the brain does. That is, a, in, in that sense, a closed system. Uh, neuronal activity leads to other neural activity. Now, that activity may arise, let's say, in the retina, they say, well, that comes from the outside. As far as the brain is concerned, there is no inside and no outside. There's only neural activity that leads to other neural activity in kind of a circular or more complex way. So a, a, an account of what the brain does can only be an, a, an account in terms of what the brain does. It's fully self-enclosed. On the other hand, you can look at the behavioral realm and say, how does uh, an organism, say a human being, as, as, as a totality, as a unity, interact with its environment, right? well, the behavior. 
um, behavior is something that plays out in the relational realm. It's, the brain does not behave, it operates in a certain way, and there are certain parts of mechanisms that work right there that we can trace down. But the brain does not behave, people behave, yeah, or animals behave. They um, behave as a relational totality, and they interact with other people or with their environment. Um, an account of that is one that can only be historical in nature, as I just said. That writing is writing because it's part of a historical practice. That means that you have to look at it indeed both historically and ontogenetically, in the sense of how do people uh, acquire the cultural skills. In both cases, it's a temporal, historical process. So I argue that there are two uh, non intersecting, non reducible, um, uh, phenomenal domains. On one hand, there's the domain of the brain and brain process that are fully self enclosed. And on the other hand, there's the behavioral realm uh, where we see uh, people, as uh, we talk about people, interact with an environment, with each other. And they cannot be reduced to each other. Um, I can know exactly what happens in the brain, but not know what somebody's thinking. I can know what they're thinking, or they can tell me what they're thinking, or they can behave in a certain way. Uh, but that itself does not tell the brain what they're I can only know that when I speak to people. Yeah? When I say, okay, when I look on both sides, uh, is there something, you know, as an observer, of course, I can straddle both sides, but I cannot reduce one to the other. So I can know at some point that when people do some kind of semantic retrieval task, that, that you know, the verdict area is, is, uh, is, is active, but I cannot know uh, purely on the basis of what's happening in verdict area what somebody's retrieving. Unless I look. Yeah? And if I do that multiple times, of course, I can make, make a fairly a good prediction. But again, that is an argument for the historical nature of that. I have to actually check multiple times in order to know what the brain is doing when somebody is retrieving bike or a tree or something. So, two different phenomenal domains, they're not reducible. So, what does that, where does that leave psychology? Uh, or the person, for that matter. Because Neuroscience without psychology is meaningless, but psychology without neuroscience uh, is, will never be able to give uh, you know, a, a, a scientific account of human behavior. I argue that the brain, if, if they never talk about the brain actually, this is the first time that I do that, but since all the brain people also talk about behavior, I feel that I am justified to talk about the brain. <laughs> the brain is nothing else than a tuning machine, a synchro machine. It syncs up with its environment. I would argue that the brain doesn't represent anything. Uh, because representation would require to do, uh, or, or, if it would be representational, it would mean that we can uh, explain what happens in the brain on the basis of what happens in the world. But we can't. In two different phenomenal domains. But what we can do is uh, look at the historic. Look, for example, what happens uh, when people acquire a skill. And uh, what, what, how the brain is involved in that. None the brain is not, what happens in the brain is not reducible to what happens in the world. What happens in the world does not explain what happens in the brain. But the two sync up. Uh, they, the brain attunes or syncs up with its environment. It doesn't represent anything, but it, it syncs up in a historical way. It's always a historical process. So my argument would be, and I know that I'm out of time, so I will not do it as extensively as I have planned is that psychology needs to develop as you know, what we used to call a genetic sense. Genetic not in the sense of genes, but in the sense of development. That we need to look at it as, for example, Vygotsky did, both in an evolutionary way, and that is the, 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 uh, the way the brain itself came about and the way it did. In a historical way, as in the way that we would study the practice of writing, and how it came about, or mathematics, or language, etc. And in an ontogenetic way, uh, that is, each individual being born with a biological body, that's a product of our evolution, also in their own lifetime has to acquire a culture. That's what we call psychological development. And I would argue that everything that we call psychological in a genuine sense is, is acquired in that. It is the entwinement of two different lines of development, an evolutionary one and a cultural historical one, in each single individual. Right? Those two come together. Um, and only when you look at it historically are you able to make sense of the relation of what happens in the brain and what happens when we act in the world. I'll leave it at that. Thank
How's it go now? Now there's something completely different. It's not just because I'm tempted to use uh, Google Drive to actually present my talk. So um, I didn't have a baby, uh, so I have not nearly the valid reason that uh, that Kyle did for uh, for not having anything prepared. I do have something prepared, um, but as I told a few people today, I've actually spent a disproportionate amount of my time in the last um, couple of weeks thinking about this question. And this is the simple question that was asked. And maybe I should have actually, I guess maybe I'm just like the people in the PMO's office. I didn't read my whole email. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I missed the little the middle, you know, as, as uh, you would have said in the fish called one, what's the middle bit again? And this is the middle bit. And here's the question that was posed. And when I went back to Jenna's email and found it, I realized what I had committed myself to. <laughs> and given that she's my graduate student, I couldn't very well disengage from the talk. So how are we going to do this? Can we even answer the question? Well, everyone that has been before me has done a really good job and a really different job from the way that I know approaches. So how do we start? And unfortunately, there's no crystal ball for me. So in the way of, of uh, the way that I do these things, you know, I figure we'll look back and see if there's anything um, from the past that can, uh, that can help us. And first of all, identify the main questions. So here's the first question. Can we truly speak of a unified agenda for psychology in the 21st century? Oh. Well, has psychology in the past, has it always been united? And uh, the, the rumbling is, is people actually uh, agree with or not. <laughs> so have we? Is unification, is us all being together one big happy family, is it based on a false self? Is it ever going to happen? For instance, our own psychology department, we're, we have a separate code from what educational psychology uh, support, uh, has in terms of the course offerings. And when someone asks me, like a, a neighbor did just the other day, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm in the psychology department. Oh, sorry. I'm sort of here with that. I have an engineering degree. And, but it's okay. Not that kind of psychology. I won't be shrinking your brain anytime or your mind or whatever Clay wants to call it. I won't do that. That's for educational psychology. They do that. So there's, there are divisions that exist. Even within our own happy family of the department, we have separate areas. We have big posters talking about the separate areas. Of course, we talk about whether well, we should have areas, and maybe we should, and maybe we shouldn't, and maybe we should just have teaching, and it's, it's a debate. Even professional organizations can't get along, so we can't all get along. CPA uh, you know, was, was one big happy family, the Canadian Psychological Association, and then you know, the radicals at the CISBIDS, Canadian Society for Brain Behavior Cognitive Science, and hell, you guys, we're going to form our own club. So, given all this, should we even aim for more unification? Or should we just leave well enough alone? Why would we want to? You know, what, what benefit, I was going to say, would we have of having educational psychology here? And of course, educational psychology would say, what in the hell benefit would we get of having you guys over there with us? And if you're going to talk about unification, how unified is unified enough. Even within a particular area, so even if you assume that we have, you use the, the nasty, the A word, and we're not talking adultery, the other A word, uh, area, which is much more evil uh, to us in psychology. We don't want to talk about areas. Even if we talk about an area, even within an area, people are um, tenuously united at best. So then if unification isn't great, what about diversification? Is that a good idea? Is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it even a thing? Should we be going for more diversification or more unification? Of course, if you want to unify, in order to get rid of these differences, to be united, you can specialize. In 
have some departments have special ones. Which brings me to this question, the second part. Will we ultimately dissolve into neuroscience? Which is kind of weird if you think about that sort of literally as yes, dissolving them, being a bunch of neurons kind of running around, you know, sending electrical impulses and chemicals and stuff. But anyway, I digress. I'll leave that as a play the student to the painted picture of psychology dissolving into neuroscience. I'm sure they'll let it join his office wall soon. So specialize, specialize, specialize. So to, to turn the sort of uh, performing arts, you know, practice, practice, practice. Specialize, specialize, specialize. And for us, maybe that's the road to Nirvana. So some departments have split. I don't know that educational psychology and human be able to split. Do we need to work together with educational psychology? Do we ever get along with them? But even more, uh, even more recently, we have departments at Lethbridge and Concordia that have, neuros have psychology departments or started with psychology departments and then have these splinter groups that go off and form their own organizations, so these massive uh, organizations like the Canadian Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, which is pretty awesome. And in Concordia, you've got the Center for, for, remember, Center for Comparative Neurobiology, something other. There's, but there's a psychology department, and then there's a neuroscience department. And that seems kind of cool, maybe. Some universities even have even more specialized units. So not only uh, neuroscience division, psychology division, but specialized units. So you might be wondering what, what AFAR stands for. So AFAR stands for the uh, reasonably recent um, unit at the University of Western Ontario, now known as simply as Western University, where uh, people study uh, a lot of things that are really near and dear to my heart. So it's the uh, Advanced Facility for Avian Research. So it's pretty cool. So it's all birds all the time. The students in my classes think I talk about birds a lot unless you go to the AFAR study. But then we come back to the same question again. Are these specialized units actually more unified? Is everyone in them? I mean, they all have birds in common. Is that enough? Certainly, the Canadian Center for Behavioral Neuroscience can go on their website. They're specialized. They study their whole brain all the time. But if you look at what people do, there's people studying stroke, there's people studying other aspects of perception. Is it all the same? Is it actually more unified? And are they better off? Are there benefits of specialization? I don't know. Or, on the flip side, should we look at psychology and what, what it is that psychology offers, this diversification, this idea of having these multiple levels that, that, we, can, uh, that we can draw on? Should we look at that not as a curse, but rather as a blessing? So does psychology offer us some good value? I think that people have uh, talked about this before, this idea that we bring together these disparate perspectives. We have people who study developmental psychology, we have people who study cultural psychology, uh, social psychology, learning, uh, neuroscience. And we're all in, uh, in, at some level at trying to ask the same questions. Maybe not the exact same questions, but the certainly the same flavor. So biological, cognitive, cultural, developmental, Etc. And of course, if you do, if you uh, look at these different perspectives and answer similar types of questions using a number of different perspectives, you get things that you normally wouldn't get if you were just using one thing. So finally, is it appropriate to talk about science and the Or would I answer to this question? Does that sound pretty hard? Right? What has psychology done for me lately? There's a faculty member on my floor that says that to his trainees. And they usually answer uh, appropriately. And when they don't, they get fired and then hired back immediately because, of course, he needs them. I, I was channeling you this talk. I knew that you love it so much. So, psychology has done a bunch of things for us lately. So, first of all, it has studied, we as psychologists have studied phenomena that are considered otherwise at least at one time, impossible to study. Memory, culture, personality, things that seem or were considered to be impossible to study, we do routinely. We even study uh, particular aspects of, of these things, and they make the front, uh, front page of the university's website. 
when people have new insights about, uh, about how it is that the molecular mechanisms of memory operate. Pretty cool. Psychology also helps us to make sense of behavior that otherwise seems pretty senseless. So think of the studies that Norbert uh, and Zimbardo did that we like to talk about in introductory psychology classes, or that people like me uh, who uh, took introductory psychology classes in huge lecture theaters actually remember from introductory psychology, which is in you know, itself a victory. And it also describes how it is that, that we as humans uh, and non human animals actually learn, of course, near the line art. And more broadly speaking, the mechanisms of cognition, also something that people might think is pretty much impossible to study. So does that have a future? Well, Chris, uh, who's now gone to his uh, well-dressed appointment, uh, in my humble opinion, I agree with him. Completely different approach to come at that uh, question than Chris did. Should we aim for more unification? This is not a lobby. Uh, it's not my stand for the department. So if you start talking about consolidation, uh, this is not a platform to try to, to make some kind of side play to uh, whether or not we should be unified with the faculty or not. All I can say is that it doesn't seem like it's either the best or necessarily the only plan uh, that is possible. It's a plan, and there are benefits, but maybe there are drawbacks too. And maybe, just maybe, we should actually embrace the multifaceted approach that, it, that we take and that we bring to understanding of behavior. Instead of trying to be more reductionist, we should try to be more inclusive. Thanks for inviting me to talk about this issue. And like Chris said, um, when I started to think about this and I started to read about this, I didn't know what question we actually were going to answer. So I decided to take a different approach to this. I knew because I was going last that the previous speakers would uh, ultimately conclude that yes, psychology does have a future. So I decided to not question whether we would be around tomorrow, but rather to ask if we are going to be around, what does the future of psychology actually look like? So, to start thinking about that, I thought back to when I first became a faculty member here in 1995. And in 1995, the then president of the uh, Canadian Psychological Association, Keith Dobson, uh, gave his presidential address, and he also published a paper in psych uh, Canadian Psychology where he talked about um, Canadian psychology and what the future would look like. And he concluded this, that psychology in Canada, the future is not the past. So he reviewed the history of psychology, and then he went on in his presidential address to talk about you know, what are the challenges of psychology that we're going to have to deal with, the kinds of hurdles we're going to have to get over so that as a, a, a discipline, as a profession, we can move forward and that we will develop. We will not be like the past. So it's 20 years now since 1995, since uh, Keith Dawson talked about what the future is and he said it was not, uh, it's not a repeating of the past. But when I started thinking about 
well, what did he say? And what is our current reality? I came up with a different uh, way of looking at that, this. So, not that it's not past, but rather, if we want to think about what the future of psychology is, we just simply need to look in the mirror. If we look at ourselves, we will see in our current state that we have not moved very far in 20 years. So it, it's almost as if, instead of looking at the future, we've been looking at the rear view mirror. It's as if we are talking about the same challenges, we're having the same discussions, and we are stuck in that dialogue. So to make this clear, what I would like to do is I would like to uh, revisit that 1995 article. I'd like to look at what uh, Keith Dawson said are our challenges and what are the things that psychology needs to do to move forward. And I'm going to compare that to our current reality. So first, when I talk about psychology, I'm going to talk about it as Dawson did. I'm going to talk about, when I say discipline, that this is the research, science, the post-secondary, or largely the university psychology, in the academic enterprise. When we talk about the profession, we're talking about the applied work. We're talking about the practice, the practitioners, uh, and what happens in the service setting. Okay. So, shift back 20 years to 1995. And this is what was said. Diminishing budgets have become a common experience for psychologists in the 1990s. University departments are either in a holding pattern or experiencing real cuts to faculty, staff, and operating budgets. At a time when the demand for psychology courses and programs have never been greater, the resources for providing services are stretched and are at its best. Hospitals, we're talking about the practitioners, um, Hospitals, schools, and other public employers and psychologists are also generally facing either maintenance or reductions of their budgets. And this has led to many healthcare settings or health settings re examining the need for psychological services to either scale back or eliminate these services or to try to obtain comparable services from less qualified and less expensive providers. Now, does that sound familiar? Because our common reality is that. Here's an article from uh, the CBC just a few days ago where uh, it's on again, off again, whether graduate students uh, in clinical psychology will be able to do the internships if, in fact, the Nova Scotia government is, is going to fund that. So our current reality is exactly as we talked about it in the 1990s. We have reduced financial resources for both the discipline and the profession. One response to this has been, uh, at various levels, when you think about what students need to do to become psychologists, now the PhD is not the gold standard. You have a master's level training happening, and people can become a psychologist, or they can become a counselor, they can be accredited, especially in Alberta, with a master's level. And so, when you go out to the job market, these people can provide service, but they are cheaper. Cheaper to get the degrees, cheaper uh, to, to pay to provide service. Dawson also said this, community and government emphasis on teaching. There's a community and government uh, emphasis on teaching, and many faculty members are experiencing a severe challenge to their energy and ability for scholarship. Sound familiar? Because that is our reality. If you take a look at what's happening at our university and universities all across North America, there is a greater emphasis on teaching, which leads to less time for our scholarship. In addition, we are talking about the need for in our teaching to involve the community, so learning outside of the classroom. At the same time, we are saying that now to be able to teach, we need to start integrating technology. So all of these same kinds of challenges uh, in, with our time exist today as they did in the 1990s. In the 1990s, governmental funding agencies may shift their focus away from basic research towards research that will enhance global competitiveness. Discussions that are currently taking place about the relative merits of interest-driven and mission-driven research highlights the shift in funding focus. I'm afraid that the mission-driven research, which is largely synonymous with research for development, as opposed to research and development, 
to, as opposed to research and development, can become a highly market-oriented process. Such a mission-oriented emphasis in research can undermine interest-driven interest -driven research, which is largely the acquisition of knowledge for its own sake, with or without commercial application. It is still a current reality. Proliferation of organizations. Chris talked about this a little bit. So in the 1990s, uh, I remember going to the CPA, and when I was there, all I could think of as a student at that time was, you know, this is just not the right place for me. This is a place for the practitioners. This is not a place to talk about our research. And so we started to have these splinter groups, and CPA started to be seen as the place for practitioners, and the annual convention would be the place for practitioners. Practitioners weren't particularly happy with that, so they started to splinter off, then you start getting these other groups. And if you think about it today, proliferation of organizations, same deal. And what has been the impact of that? Well, as organizations like CPA, APA, this has led to a, a dilution of influence that these organizations can have in the broader society, their ability to lobby for resources, because there are so many splinter groups. So for example, we are well aware um, of what's happened with the Hoffman Report through the APA, that in fact it has been found that uh, the leadership of the, uh, of the APA were, were involved uh, with the Bush government in providing consultation and assistance in how to interrogate, interrogate people um, harshly. And we know that. And so the, the result has been that the APA is outraged by this. They've come together and they have made the statement at the last annual convention that uh, psychologists shall not conduct, supervise, be in the presence of, or otherwise assist with national security interrogations for any military or intelligence entities. And it goes on. And I'm thinking, I don't know how many of you are out there who are members of APA, but about 35% of the uh, membership of the APA are academics working in universities. We're not bound to have to be a member of the APA. And that kind of statement, if the Bush administration came and, and asked me to help with something, I'm not bound by that. So there's some question about what are our national organizations doing for us? Uh, what is their influence with all the splintering that is in fact happening? Consumerism. We now have issues of psychology application. People 
want psychology, psychology resonates, people want to be able to take the findings of psychology and use it in some way. Let me give you a couple of examples of the problem with application. When I was working in the Center for Teaching and Learning, I became very interested in um, instructional design, and I started looking and listening to what people would say is good instructional design. And this is an example of someone talking about good instructional design making use of the seven plus or minus two as the capacity of the human ability to process. And so we have to chunk things together. But if you read this last statement, that you, know, you have to structure your course this way, you have to get the information this way, or else students are just going to cram for the exam, and then they're going to forget it, it's going to be out of there um, immediately after the exam. What this is showing is that very simple for us notions of what short-term memory and long-term memory are have become so embedded in how we do research, how we think about the theory. The jargon is so particular to our discipline that those who try to apply it cannot. They struggle with knowing what those terms mean. And this person, because they are psychologists, but they're interested in psychology and research, can't make sense of what you really want to do with this finding. Same thing happens in healthcare. Same thing happens uh, when people try to take psychology and research and use it as a prescription for what leaders want to know, for example. Every leader ought to know this, because when they're in that situation, then they need to know this study because they're going to act this way. And Chris is up, or Core has already told us that 36% of uh, many of the psychology results that we have can't be replicated. So, do we have a research base that can provide the prescription that society seems to be looking for? Psychology is a business. So Dawson talked about it in the 1990s as uh, the need for revenue generation and to think of psychology not simply in terms of where we can get mutual funding sources, but the fact that we need to start thinking now about psychology as being able to generate money different sources of revenue. And again, this should sound very familiar to you because we are still and currently in that revenue generation mode. <coughs> I was very happy in 1995 to, to see that because of population aging, psychology was going to have a real focus on aging. Uh, the more complex reality now is that that hasn't really materialized. Uh, psychology isn't a good leader in terms of thinking about aging. Rather, it's more the domain of health sciences, and there's a, a predominance of geriatrics and aging and health as opposed to gerontology and study of aging. <coughs> In 1995, we talked about a need to be sensitive to multiculturalism in our curriculum and training, and in fact, uh, we still are talking about that today. Again, the need for the consumer to be consumer oriented, we rejected that. And again, finally, this, uh, this notion of the scientific, uh, experimental side versus the humanistic side of practitioners. And again, our current discussion, like here today, is to, to continue with these dichotomies of what um, psychology is really about. And so those kinds of things continue. So, what does the future of psychology really look like? All I can conclude is that when we look back, it looks like we haven't, as a, as a discipline, moved forward to, to create our future. In fact, what we're doing is running around, splintering, uh, creating research that is very difficult for the common uh, person to understand. And as a result, our future surely will exist, but we need to really be focusing on how do we move that forward as opposed to looking simply in the mirror. Thank you.
Sorry? Or fourth group discussion. Yes. Something that actually happens, some sort of extant behavior 
maybe was there a dilation of pupils, you know, flushing, whatever else, and that, you know, is something that, that exists, um, and that maybe, you know, there's this physical manifestation that then has this sort of cultural or other label that's applied to it. Yes, there's a little bit Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I think you need to do both, but it, it seems to me the question that you asked to say, where does it start? Uh, can only have one answer, and that is in, in the context of memory life. Because why would you look at uh, dilating pupils or you know people sweating or blood pressure going down, etc., if you are, don't already have an understanding of what it is that you're trying to understand? Yes? And this, there's, in the context of everyday life, you observe uh, behaviors. I, I think it's a naive understanding that behaviors, I mean, behaviors fail precisely because of this. Namely, in its, in its claim that it could somehow start out with something objective. The behavior is something, you know, very much the same as the physics study. Uh, as, you know, moving bodies in space. But, of course, already to call something behavior is already to be uh, There is no behavior in a purely physicalistic sense. And, and in that sense, it's uh, unfortunate that Chris uh, had to go. Uh, I think that was his argument uh, as well. Um, we, behavior is always already identified within the context of life uh, and abstract from that. But uh, we cannot start with that abstraction. And once we have identified it in the context, is it true? <laughs> 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 so all those brilliant words that I just spoke were not working anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so my point would be that it's, it's in the realm of intelligent behavior where you first struck by something, you say, hey, how come? What's up there? Why do people do that? Uh, or something like that. So there's a question that's born there. And then you can do all the things. You can look at uh, the physiological underpinning, the, the brain, etc. I think that is all very relevant. But the question is born in, in life. It's, it's, it's behavior. And behavior is behavior not because there's a movement in space, but because there is uh, something that we understand. Uh, when I, you know, do this and waving, but it's only waving because uh, there's a simple convention in the culture. Writing, speaking, walking. And I'm not saying it's not a biological site, but we identify them first in the context of our normal everyday lives. And that's where psychology is one as well. Uh, psychology, however, now asks questions like, hey, what are, you know, biological underpinnings? Those are relevant questions, but it can only do that because it already has an understanding of, of behavior that arises from the, 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 the realm of everyday life. If I, if I could push just a little farther than this, I won't say anything more, actually, but when you say, in the context of, of jobs that happens in everyday life, and there are things, physiological responses like pupil dilation, etc., is it possible? Because now we're, we're, we're reducing it now to what the brain can sense. Is it possible that there are other things happening in the context of jealousy that we just simply, that the brain may or may not be detecting, but we just simply don't know how to look for it? Right? So it could be that there are, in the context of, of someone being jealous, there could be changes in temperature, or there could be other things happening in that environment that because we don't categorize it that way, we would never look for it to see a physiological response. But nonetheless, it could be happening. Well, I, I'm sure I'm sure there is. I, I guess the, the one thing that that I that I sort of come back to is a uh, a recent study in, in uh, I can't remember which was that in Science or Nature sort of bit on the spot like, where they showed altruistic behavior, rescue behavior in rats. With the, uh, the box and the chocolate chip and... Uh, I, yeah, I think it's a science, so that's the subject of being shown that. Right. It's true social behavior. Right, and it's exactly, but I mean, so that happens. So you've got this, this behavior in rats that looks, you know, it's labeled as altruism, and then other colleagues of ours published a similar study, a very brilliant study showing rescue behavior in ants, where ants will, you know, untie, basically like the same person from the brain tracks that can rescue this man. And they're, they're not allowed to, or we want to call it altruism, but depending on the sort of phylogenetic level that you're looking at, you call this thing, you know, one thing or another. You know, if it was, if it was Sharia and I stuck in a plexiglass container, and I knew that, well, I would be an altruistic person, but, um, and 
and as long as I'm not bad and until otherwise proven, then I can still be altruistic. But if we are in it, well, that's a lot. We can't be, we can't be considered altruistic because surely to God, ants can't show altruism. And but so I mean, it, it, it's, it's things like that that make me wonder about you know, just sort of appealing to you know what happens in everyday life. And this, maybe a, a, a rat isn't in everyday life gets stuck in a plexiglass container and has to choose between letting his comrade out and sacrificing his chocolate. But I think that it's meant to. Uh, to show a, a type of behavior that, or a type of situation that they may run into, and seeing, you know, if rats possess, you know, rogue morals, as it were. And, you know, on its face, anyways, it looks, you know, like, you know, people in furry suits. So, makes me wonder about the, the specialness of, of us as humans. And this question? So, um, I like this discussion because it, it gets uh, to, I think it brings in what Chris was talking about in terms of representation and levels of representation. Um, what I found funny is that a core, you said you don't, you don't think that there should be rep. I agree with you, but for a completely different reason. Uh, the fact is, is that we as humans develop a level of representation that, it, that tries to explain each other's or our conspecifics behavior. Um, but what it doesn't do, uh, and I think Chris is alluding to this, is it doesn't explain very well uh, animal behavior. And given the fact that we share so much physiology, uh, it often surprises me when other people are surprised by how similar we actually are in terms of behavior. So I mean, my point would be to focus less on our representations of you know, how we predict others uh, behaviors and start looking at the universals. So I, I would argue with Chris that yeah, maybe we should be looking, Chris Sturdy that is, that maybe we should be looking for unified uh, elements in terms of discussing theories of behavior per se uh, and not worrying so much about humans but trying to learn some lessons from animals. Yeah, I think you made a, a few points, and I'm not sure if I can respond to, to all of them in, in one answer, but um, I mean, I, I agree, and I also think it's not the whole story. As far as the universals, uh, you know, I, being a cultural psychologist, tend to come from the other side and say, I, I'm interested in what makes humans different. Yeah? Not because I want us to be special, but because I think that uh, humans are the only species that, as far as I know, that uh, operate within a normative level. Let's say if I take, take anger or aggression, it's, it's, it's called anger. Uh, if I ask anyone here, say, well, can you remember an episode you like if you feel angry and what makes you angry? It's very likely that it will be about an insult, offense, or something that was unfair, you know, something that treated you in a certain way. Um, those are the kinds of people, I mean, we very quickly say that anger is universal emotion that we share with animals, that we can recognize it. Uh, but I doubt that, maybe with the exception of my dog, uh, that uh, animals get insulted or that they uh, uh, feel that they're unfairly treated or something like that. Um, so it means that, that anger in humans, as far as I can tell, is, is always already infused with a moral or normative understanding, which, you know, that's my argument, can only derive from, from culture, from a cultural sort of understanding. So, yes, I agree with you. I think we, we need to do that, but I also think it's not the whole story. And I think psychology has maybe, in my perception, been a bit too strongly biased in one direction, um, you know, in its attempt to become a behavioral science and have unified uh, principles of, of, uh, of uh, behavior, explained behavior. Um, and I think we have learned a lot from that. But uh, it seems to me that when I look at human behavior, it's obvious. That, that there's something unique to you and it has that relates to our, our uh, uh, possession of language, it uh, relates to uh, uh, us having self-understanding, it relates to us having some kind of moral agency, doing things that we find right or wrong. And all those things I can't see in animals. But it would still be interesting to see if they're criminals uh, or something that prefigures that or, or maybe uh, is more moral than I think, you know, than I hope it to be. Uh, Dogs, I don't know exactly. I think the dogs are somewhat. 
Right? That's because they're always good. Because of their culture? Yeah, because their biological evolution has been selected by humans precisely for their strength for the last 60,000 years. My dog, I think, experiences, don't know that, they can't ask, but, you know, I see indignation, I see jealousy. That can be my anthropomorphic projection, but the, I think dog, dogs are a different story, but precisely because we have dog, the dogs, we have done the same as with ourselves, we have culture. Uh, and, and, uh, I mean, and, and I think that we humans are, you know, have done that with ourselves, we have cultivated ourselves. Such that our behaviors now are, are not purely biological. They're infused with a, 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 a moral, normative, a cultural, historical understanding. And I challenge you to find any, any example of real everyday behavior that's not uh, normative in some sense, uh, even perception. Uh, but I see the pattern cut. I see it right away in terms of its normative affordances, but what, you know, what I'm supposed to do with it. Uh, that is, that there's just a, a, a cultural change in the internet that took years, but now I see it. Uh, it's, it's immediate uh, perception we give it. So I would say even your perception is not as purely biological as we made it out to be. So just to, just to say a couple of things, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, cultural as well as social influences are really important in, in terms of human behavior. But I would go further. I would argue that in any social animal, those are, those are elements. So it's not u uniquely human. I think as psychologists, we have this problem of creating um, shorthand for explaining behavior. So we create concepts and constructs that help us to say, oh, well, this explained uh, Chris Dirty's behavior. He's just jealous uh, of you know, all the press I got uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, that, that's just my, my shorthand. I have no idea uh, if, if Chris was jealous or maybe he was really happy for me, right? But at the same time, by creating that shorthand, it becomes problematic because then I start going and looking for it. There's no reason why I should find that in the brain. There's no reason why there should be any structure that would be devoted to that. I think that that's the, 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 the real crux of the problem. When you look at the difference, let's say, I mean, I'm not picking neuroscience as the, the, the ultimate here. What I'm saying is that that level of discourse actually has very little to do with what we would actually study in the brain you know, if we were going to go look for a brain-based uh, explanation of behavior that was pure. Um, any speaker to step in? Can I respond to that directly now? Um, I agree with you. I, I, in, 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 I think um, you know we agree in many ways. Um, um, I'm just coming from a different direction. Here. One thing that I'm not arguing is that we should somehow you know take folk psychological categories in an explanatory account of, of human behavior. I think that's amazing. All I was saying is that uh, any notion of behavior is born in, in everyday life, but then you know then. The psychologists to start. So uh, I'm not saying that they're already explained. Um, and I agree that, that there's no reason why folk psychological categories need to have some kind of direct implementation in the brain. But that's why I said earlier. Um, I feel that there are two different kinds of accounts, and it is not so easy to know how they would sync up. Um, when you study the brain, you study the brain. I don't think you need to introduce um, folk psychological. But when you study jealousy in the realm of everyday life, uh, and, you know, and, and usually those questions are born out of you know, problems. You see that people do dysfunctional things when they're jealous, or, you know, that they do things that they'd rather not do, because that's part of psychology. That people do not know why they do things. Uh, so, and they often they do things that they'd rather not do. Uh, so now psychologists start to say, okay, can we understand that? Uh, and, I think it's an interesting question how those two different accounts, the, the account of meaningful behavior in the everyday realm and the account of what the brain does, how would, is there any way in which they can meet at some point? And, uh, but I said earlier, uh, if there is, it cannot be a representation. So it needs to be something else. Or already said, my, my follow up question was going to be that what if Chris did not know that he was jealous? 
and if it was some other, maybe it was fear, or maybe he, he he's, he's behaving in a way that looks like jealousy, but he does not know that. But I think that then this is, a, I, I think that's a fundamental characteristic of uh, analyzing our own behavior. We don't know, but our brains do. So you would look for jealousy, and if you saw all that, you'd say that. No, what, 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 but you see, in order to, in order to produce behavior, what you need is you need a record of the past. Um, and, and that's the, the fundamental thing, I think, that uh, you get out of uh, this. So, in order to explain someone's behavior, I have to understand what they've been through. Uh, and that's, that's really the only thing that uh, allows me to, to, to get any insight into into their behavior at all. If I've met someone for the first time and they behave in a particular way, I'll just say, well, that must be them, that must be an individual difference. Uh, I have no idea if uh, perhaps they're afraid of the color red and I've just happened to uh, worn a, a red sweater. But the brain has a record of those and that's what influences behavior. I think that uh, in terms of the ultimate explanation of, uh, of behavior, we really do have to look for uh, a neuroscientific approach. I think the one interesting point, just to follow up on what you were saying, but um, you know, we might, we, we might, like, if I can remember correctly, you know, we might do, we might do things when uh, when we're when we're experiencing jealousy, um, and we and you said that we might do things that we might that we that we regret, we don't want to do, but I think. I think that when you say that, and, and let's take this in the, in the sort of intellectual academic context in which I'm, I'm making these points, but you know, so you use the sort of uh, you know, jilted, jealous lover, right? They kill the offending uh, person that's, that's intervening in the relationship and they, and they regret this happening. So is there not an argument, uh, or could you not make an argument that the reason that they actually regret killing person that's getting between them and their mate is only because they know now that they're going to be incarcerated and put into jail. But in a biological context, if there were two songbirds, for instance, who are competing in the territory and one bird kills the other bird, I don't really think that he's going to sit around moralizing that, and that maybe the fact that, that, you, that we have this idea that humans are a human would be sad about it, uh, a negative outcome like that is, you know, as the saying goes, because they got caught. You know, you, you hear about you hear about this all the time. At least recently, there are some business partners. You know, they get jealous, and some, I think it was this in Sherwood Park. You know, some guy kills his business partner, cuts him up, and puts him into a concrete footing, and goes about his life. How can he live with the guilt? Well, maybe he doesn't have it because he didn't get caught. <laughs> And he isn't actually sorry that he killed and cut off his friend. I mean, I'm not excusing the behavior, but I'm trying to be jealous of it. And maybe we aren't, you know, maybe we're, maybe the difference is that we have, uh, is because of the culture that, uh, that of incarceration. Um, Jealousy is just a placeholder. Uh, it's just is a word that 
you know, that loosely connects to the events of phenomena. So I can ask somebody here, uh, can you remember an episode of your life that you're very jealous? And most people would come out with a story. So it, it does do something. Uh, but I, I think it would be a misunderstanding to say we need to somehow pin down, you know, that, that, that essence and then see how it is represented in the brain. Uh, I agree with precisely the point that both of you made. Uh, you need to give the historical account of behavior. Yeah, and that means that the behavior is observable. Uh, in that sense, you know, the good behaviors have a right. But they didn't have a right is that they thought they could give a purely uh, objective account of it. And I think you can't. I think, uh, even by us speaking, you can't. Um, there's already, uh, you know, even biological organisms are sense makers. They, they need to somehow make sense, uh, but they may not do that in the way that we do, they may not language, etc. But all those are all the questions for me. But, um, but causes of, of an animal to behave on the basis of certain stimulus is not a stimulus as a physical thing, but it, the way it makes sense of that stimulus, uh, if, if, you, if I'm allowed to use that word, making sense. Uh, and that has something to do with you know, the, the, the structural organization of the organism itself. Um, but, so there's no objective account of behavior, I think, in the way the behavior is thought of us. But, yes, you do need to look at behavior. So how would you respond to, for instance, Kyle's not a zombie person? If I walked up to you and I said, I don't have any subjective experience, and when people talk about minds and making sense, I really don't know what they're talking about. I behave, and I behave in a way that sort of just goes along so people don't put me in an insane zone. How, how would you respond to someone who said, I, I have no subjective experience? How would you convince this audience that I actually am subjectively aware of things and not just behave? Well, you know, I, I would think, for me, that those kinds of thought experiments are ultimately incoherent. They, they, they're meaningless. Um, so here's somebody, so you say, I don't have subjective experience, and you go through great lengths to, to make me understand it, etc. I, you know, I don't really worry about that, uh, whether you have subjective experience. I, I, because I think <laughs> meaning or significance or whatever you want to call is not in you. Uh, it's not something that you have or don't have or that's in you or is not in you. But again, that's kind of a metaphysical essentializing of, of, of experience. Uh, for me, all significance and all behavior uh, is always out there. Um, uh, it is, meaning does not exist in you, and it doesn't exist as a purely subjective experience. Even if you talk about your most subjective experience, you have to do that in categories that are intelligible and meaningful for others as well. So, my most intimate experience of jealousy, guilt, or whatever, uh, I can only, even for myself, only understand the cultural categories that I share with other people. Even if I went back in my diary and say, you know, I feel so alone, nobody understands me. Well, if somebody were to read that, they would understand. Because everybody has had that experience. Those are not solitary experiences. That's, that's, the, that's the point. So, meaning's out there. Uh, and so, and we can observe it. Can you actually tell someone, I have no subjective experience? If you have no subjective experience, you can only say I can that. say, I don't know what you mean by that. I, mean, I can't, I can't, the problem is our language is built in such a way that I don't know that there is a way to convey that without actually making that sort of claim. In, in um, most parts of the world, the question, what is your subjective experience, is, is how do you use it? Is, it's very characteristic for our current culture, we talk a lot about ourselves, to even talk about our personal experience. <coughs> Uh, that, that's one of the problems of cross-cultural psychology, because we want to know the experience of people in, you know, the, the, the time in rural India or something, and then we bring up questionnaires, and, and then somebody says, well, you know what, I'll call in my family, and we can fill it out together. So you know, we need to individualize. It, it still doesn't remove the problem that we're talking about, the, the sort of philosophical zombie problem. And it seems to me that your sort of whole approach requires uh, this. Like, like, you couldn't refer to the whole jealousy argument without that phrase making sense, you know. Yeah. You don't want to reduce that to just neuroscience, yeah. just environmental events or anything like that. 
there's something else in there. There's like a third. But that's not subjective experience. Subjective. I mean, I'm not saying that there is no subjective experience, but what I'm saying is that that is always experience already filtered through the categories of, of, of culture. So, the uh, for me, the, the as soon as you say meaning, or significance, etc., in in the human behavioral realm. You say culture, you say stuff that we share, we can talk about what we do right here. And we're not exchanging subjective experiences. If they would really be subjective and purely solitary and purely their own, nobody could understand it because they would talk about it, it would be incoherent. So uh, the fact that we can talk about it and that novelists can write beautiful novels about it means that, that the, the terms in which we experience it are already shared. Um, but everything, yeah, like a novelist, writing a novel is a behavior. A person speaking a poem is a behavior. It's That's not the experience. experience. It seems like you're complaining. Yeah. Now, I think that the, the problem is not with uh, whether we need to add something to behavior to make it significant. I think our understanding of behavior itself is, is too shallow. Again, that, you know, in, in some sense, I am happy to be a behaviorist if, if we would have a risk understanding of behavior. That, that you know the behaviors didn't have that, and the cognitivists don't have it either. They because they want to add something, to it. and the whole problem with representation is to say, well, you need to have something that's both physical and also has meaning, and we call that representation. But that's 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 nonsense because the meaning uh, needs to derive somewhere in the first place, and that that is not in your individual mind. That is in, in the social world. Yeah. I mean, where does the mean like? You know, you're talking about behaviorists and, and they need the meaning. I, I've never heard a behaviorist talk in those terms. Not, not a serious one. Like, I, I'm, not even, I'm not sure what kind of behaviorist you're talking about. Well, you know, uh, when behaviorism, I, I, I don't want to kind of take over this discussion, so I'm going to put it away in a moment. But, you know, since we had a discussion here, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I think in the. In the uh, in the heydays of behaviors, and there were several alternatives that were not necessarily just cognitive. Um, you know, there's kind of the Wittgensteinian account, there is George Herbert Mead. George Herbert Mead, that I want to use him as an example, he talked about meaning, and he called himself a social behaviorist. Now, that's not, of course, how we now remember behaviorism, but I think when, when psychologists started to figure out that they needed to put the mind back in psychology, because we need to understand how people make sense of things and not just how they respond to neutral uh, or objective stimuli. Uh, they thought that they, they needed to find that somehow in the mind. And what I'm arguing is uh, we need to find that within the social culture now. That, that this meaning is, is always inherent in social cultures. Uh, for the words that I use here only mean something because others can understand what it means, not just because I understand what it means. So the meaning is inherently shared. It only has meaning because you understand my words and I use them. Uh, so yeah, if, I, if, I, if I know what one understands them, it's not a language.
psychology is that there, there is this, you know, that we can have debates like this, and that we do have this wide range of things that we want to study. And that's why, I, I don't know how many times, if I had a nickel, I could, I could have a revenue generation. If I had some amount of money, larger than a nickel, for every time someone finds out what I do for research, and then that, I, that I'm in a psychology department, probably not dissimilarly to what happens with Peter. Um, you know, why do you study bird behavior when you're in a psychology department? I mean, I think that's pretty demonstrative of how diversified we can be, or at least how diversified some departments are willing to be. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I guess if, if, uh, if our department, whether it had the size or the will um, to be bigger than it is, that at some point you get enough um, you know, people out in the left field like Pete and I studying fish and birds and whatever else, that, that there'd be enough of us to sort of fly away into the sunset and form our, our own department. But I don't know if that would be, if that would be a better thing or not. You know, in, in some respects, you might think it is, but I can tell you that working in, in a, a neurobiology department at, at Duke University seemed on its face like a dream. And it's pretty cool to be, you know, riding up and down famous people who are editors of famous journals, but it's, you know, going past everyone's lab and seeing, you know, one neurophysiology rig after another, while initially pretty awe-inspiring, after a while, it's like, okay, um, you know, I went down to Miguel Nicolelos's lab, you know, someone actually had an animal that was still alive, on purpose, <laughs> right? It actually was alive. For re and, and it was alive as part of an experiment, as opposed to uh, being alive on deck for a terminal experiment or some kind of a recording experiment. It was, it was pretty cool. You know, whether you know, sit under a barrel recording you know, sleep weight patterns or you know, Marshall Schuller doing stuff with, uh, with olfaction or work. But, but I miss that a lot. So, I don't know. I think that I think we, we may want to be careful what we wish for. Thing that we, we all want. And it gets 
lost in the, the in this academic environment of just doing research because you need. And it's really easy to lose that north, but if you simplify things, you think about life and that one little thing that everybody wants, you just it comes back to you. I think that's that's what kept coming back to me during this whole thing. It was the happiness, the one the, the well being. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So I would like to finish this off by thanking you all for attending today. It wouldn't be possible without your attendance. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank our five speakers. Uh, Chris has left, um, but I would also just slide it past here. Um, just each speaker is getting one of these pedantic t-shirts. <laughs> And we, um, we also have this shirt here uh, for essentially the best audience member, which uh, I'm going to give to Clayton. Oh. <laughs> It's just because I'm jealous I wasn't invited to this year's bid That's, that's of course, well. <laughs> what are you telling me? Nobody does this stuff. Perfect. Yes, it will be in for next time. Um, I'd also like to thank Warren Relang, who helped organize this. Um, and I put my email address up here uh, to contact me with ideas for future events, or more specifically, ideas for future demand. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you all for coming.